Welcome back everyone. This is Lecture 2 for Chapter 5, Volcanoes and Volcanic Hazards. Today I'm going to talk about different types of volcanoes, different landforms or shapes for the volcano. I want to start with shield volcanoes. These are typical of volcanic islands such as the Hawaiian Islands. They are broad, slightly domed in shape, and due to the fluid nature, the non-viscous nature of the magma, they do not have steep slopes, they produce mild eruptions, and cover large areas because of the non-viscous nature of the lava. So examples include Hawaiian Islands, the Canary Islands, Galapagos Islands, and Easter Island. Mauna Loa on the Big Island of Hawaii is the largest volcano on Earth. It's taller than Mount Everest if you count all the way down to the sea floor and up. Taking a look at the Big Island of Hawaii and the different shield volcanoes. Kilauea is active currently and has been since the 1980s, continuously outpouring basaltic, non-viscous lava. In the background here we have a picture of Mauna Loa. It is up high enough in the air that it is snow covered. So on the big island of Hawaii you can go from a desert climate to a tropical rainforest to snow-topped mountains. Cinder cones are the next type of volcano I would like to talk about, and they are quite interesting. Sometimes they are called scoria cones. With a cinder cone, it is built up from ejected lava fragments, and so these lava fragments stick to the side of the volcano, making the angle of the slope quite steep. However, they are not very tall, 300 30 to 300 meters tall, often occur in fields or in groups. And Paracutan, located west of Mexico City, is an example of a cinder cone. It is unusual in that it erupted for almost 10 years. Generally, a cinder cone will erupt for one year and then it becomes extinct. Paracutan was a very unusual cinder cone. This is a cinder cone, SP Crater, north of Flagstaff, Arizona, and there's a whole field of these cinder cones. It also, you can see, has erupted a lava flow in addition to the pyroclastic cinders that ejected to the flanks of the volcano. His, here is Paracutin, the cinder cone, uh, located near Mexico City, and its eruption history lasted for nine years. Here in this picture you can see uh, the whole entire town covered uh, from lava and just the uh, remnants of the church remaining. The composite volcanoes, or also known as stratovolcanoes, are our last type of volcano we'll talk about. These are your classic shaped volcanoes that you think of, the symmetrical cones, very high up in the air and wide at the base. And they are composite in the sense that they consist of interbedded lava flows and then pyroclastic debris. Most of these composite volcanoes are lo located in the Ring of Fire in the Pacific Ocean. Examples, Mount St. Helens and Mount Etna. These types of volcanoes are the ones that erupt the pyroclastic material and are quite dangerous. Classic example of a stratovolcano. Let's differentiate between the volcanoes we just spoke about. Here is our shield volcano. Mauna Loa is a good example. 
Notice that it does not have the steep flanks, but nonetheless quite high here is your scale showing height. Here is our composite cone or stratovolcano, Mount Rainier in Washington State as an example. Not nearly as wide at the base because the material that is erupted from composite cones is much more viscous and tends to collect along the sides or the flanks rather than stream out great distances. And then finally, our cinder cones are the smallest sunset crater, Arizona, as an example. Pyroclastic flows are quite dangerous. It is a mixture of hot gases infused with ash and lava fragments that flow down a volcanic slope. A new ardent is the term that we use to describe a flow that races down the flank of a volcano and it's moving because of gravity. Material is propelled, ejected from the vent at very high speeds, and then it can travel quite quickly, 60 miles per hour, for example. Pyroclastic flows are generally uh, a result of the collapse of a tall eruption column. This is St. Pierre on the Caribbean island of Martinique and Mount Pele erupted in 1902. Here's a picture before the eruption and after the eruption, and a Nue Ardant killed everyone on the island except for a prisoner who was in a dungeon and some people that were on boats out in the harbor. Another example of pyroclastic hazard was Pompeii that erupted all the way back in 79 AD. Here they have recreated, they have made plaster casts of some of the vic victims as a result of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. Another volcanic hazard are called lahars. This is a mud flow and it can be on an active or inactive volcano. When volcanic debris becomes saturated with water due to heavy rainfall, the material may loosen and go racing down the slope of the mountain. Mount St. Helens, 1980 eruption, several lahars were generated. 1985, lahars were responsible for killing 25,000 people during the eruption of Nevado del Ruiz. Check out this bridge. The lahar, this mud flow, is carrying a whole bridge with it. Here's a close-up in this picture. Here's a lahar deposit. You can see how high up on this building that mud is. It will simply bury everything in its path. Another volcanic hazard we've been made aware of over the last decade are tsunamis. Volcanic ash is a hazard not only to people's lungs because it's silica, but also to jet engines in airplanes. Volcanic gases can be quite noxious and produce a health hazard. Ash and other pyroclastic materials can collapse the roofs or completely cover buildings. Lava flows can destroy homes, burn them to the ground. Here's a picture of a stratovolcano with a pyroclastic eruption occurring. The material goes up in the air, collapses down on itself, and here's your pyroclastic flow. This is your Nue Ardant. Large volcanic eruptions can actually change the climate. When you inject ash and gases into the atmosphere, it reflects solar energy back into space and can cause cooling. 1783, the Lackey eruption in Iceland affected the weather. Mount Tambora led to a year without summer, as they referred to it, in 1816. And El Shoshone in Mexico in 1982 produced huge amounts of sulfur dioxide that then combined with water vapor to produce sulfuric acid droplets. 
I think this is a good stopping point. Our next video will be video three for chapter five. We'll see you then.